Elsa didn't ramp with the Caribbean at all last week and it's just the start of what's expected to be a very active hurricane season. As if COVID-19 and St. Vincent Volcano aren't already enough this year. So much drama in the Caribbean, so little money. Well, the Caribbean Development Bank, CDB, has a new president, Dr. Jean Leon. We'll find out what his plans are for the region's development. We have, a, I think, a tremendous amount of work to do. And then the analysts weigh in on the latest market developments. Like, I can't believe bread is $400. One pack of bread, you know. Two small bags, you know. Two small <laughs> bags. And they tell me, no, I, it, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> Especially, yeah. And I, look, I looked at the bags and I looked at the cashier. How will this inflation affect your investments? Pretty much the expectation that as the economy reopens, you know, there's a lot of spending and, you know, there's a lot of demand for commodities. So prices have spiked. The BOJ will start testing digital Jamaican dollars in August. Yes, so certainly big things happening. The rollout's going to be in August starting with NCB. And proven investments, earnings are out. How did they do? Over that time frame, from then to now, Google has collected US $9.26 million, $9.62 million US dollars in dividends. That's our discussion with the analysts. I'm Kalila Reynolds and welcome to Taking Stock. We're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it will affect you and your money. But before we get started, head over to my website, kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter to get my newsletter straight to your inbox twice a week. You can click the link up here or in the description box below. Now, come on, let's get this money. But first, here's what's hot. Brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. Barita shareholders are expected to consider another additional public offer APO. Barita said its board of directors will meet on July 14 to consider and possibly recommend an extraordinary general meeting. It says the meeting will be used to table a resolution to raise additional capital. If shareholders agree, this would be Barita's second APO in about a year. The company raised $13.5 billion in an APO last September. Jamaicans can now sell goods on Amazon without going through a third party. The e-commerce giant recently added 85 countries, including Jamaica, to its list of approved countries for seller registration. This means local businesses can now register to sell goods using local documents, including government-issued identification, company documents, and bank documents. Co-founder of Balance Ecom Training, Barrington McIntosh, told Khalida Reynolds Media that the decision is major news for local companies, as they will no longer need to partner with others or have bulk products in order to sell on Amazon. McIntosh has been selling on the platform for 11 years. He says businesses can expect to pay Amazon $39.99 US to fulfill orders through its centers. The company will make payouts every two weeks after collecting payments from customers and removing their fees. Amazon is expected to outline how it will be managing payments shortly. Just two months ago, eBay also added Jamaica to the list of its approved countries for sellers. The Bank of Jamaica BOJ says the pilot of its much-anticipated central bank digital currency CBDC will start next month. The test was expected to start in May. BOJ Governor Richard Biles says technical support, among other inputs, are now being reviewed to facilitate National Commercial Bank NCB as the first financial institution to test the system. He says between September and December, more banks will also be recruited to pave the way for a full rollout of the digital currency in 2022. The CBDC will only be sold to licensed commercial banks, deposit-taking institutions, DTIs, and payment service providers authorized by the BOJ. The financial institutions will hold the CBDC in digital wallets for customers to access and make purchases or receive payments from mobile phones. Apple will be issuing three new classes of preference shares to help refinance its $1.21 billion debt. The shares can be upsized to $1.45 billion. Apple is looking to issue 15 million Class A preference shares with a 5% rate due in 2023. 
25 million Class B preference shares with a 7.25% rate due in 2026 and a 20 million Class C preference shares with a 7.75% rate due in 2028. All of the preference shares are priced at $20 each. A minimum of 200 shares or $4,000 is required to subscribe to the offer. General Manager of Epley Justin Nam told the Business Observer that the company intends to deploy the additional funds in its asset management and proprietary investment portfolios for the remainder of 2021. Group CEO of Grace Kennedy Limited Don Webby says the group's remittance business continues to dominate the market share. In a statement to the Jamaica Observer, Webby said the company has seen considerable growth over the last year and in the first quarter of 2021, in keeping with the trends reported by the Bank of Jamaica. He says the numbers are also tracking ahead of the total market inflows for the first quarter of the year. G. Kermit and Services offers Western Union. While giving no specific numbers, both Western Union and MoneyGram have reported improved market positioning 15 months after the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic due to greater use of digital platforms. What's Heart was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. When we come back, there's a new chief at the CDB. What's his recovery plan for the Caribbean? Hey, moneymakers, you're not an official part of the family until you have your merch. Visit kalilorenalds.com slash store to order your t-shirt and your mask today. Let's get this money. This segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Welcome back to Taking Stock. Hurricanes, COVID, volcano. The Caribbean is going to need a lot of financing to bounce back. So how much exactly and where will we get the money? Joining me now is President of the Caribbean Development Bank, CDB, Dr. Jean Leon. Hi, Dr. Leon, it's great to have you on and congratulations on your appointment as the new president of the Caribbean Development Bank. Thank you. And hosting your, your first uh, annual meeting as president, how was it? I, I think it was a very good experience. Um, we, of course, were doing the virtual, uh, virtual annual meeting for the second time, but this time we were able to I think put on a few more activities than we did last year. We were able to reach a much uh, wider audience only because we managed to um, have the meetings spread over two weeks. We had great discussions on the, the power of innovation. We had one on COVID-19, the state of play in the region. We had something on climate change uh, leading into COP26 and a fascinating um, group of young people uh, who were young entrepreneurs in our Vibesing um, segment that really talked about uh, what's it like being an innovator, an entrepreneur, and a young person. And uh, it, it was an amazing line of uh, difference in, let's say, cultures. I think the way the youth see the world, the sorts of opportunities they are looking for, uh, where we start now as the status quo, we have, a, I think, a tremendous amount of work to do in terms of bringing the, not necessarily divergent, but different viewpoints, different ways of looking at the world together. If we are to bridge in a continuum the entrepreneurs that see themselves as young and those that are already there so that we have that transition in a way that is uh, progressive and um, add value adding to, to the region. But I was really very encouraged by the, the young group we had from different countries telling us their stories, um, their successes, what they've learned from making mistakes the benefits yes. of risk taking they they all very very um very useful and of course we we had the the broader plenaries where we met with just uh, the the board of governors the board of directors all in all I, i'd say a very very good first um first annual meeting for me well, that's great. So you take over the, the reins of the CDB at a very challenging time, probably the most challenging in, in a, not probably, definitely the most challenging in our lifetimes. We've never seen anything at all like this. And I'm sure at a time like this, everybody's looking to you, looking to the CDB saying, what's CDB doing? What can you do? 
what so what are you doing for the region at a time like this governor uh, sorry well, president i think i think it all starts it all starts from a good solid diagnosis um uh objective look at what we can do and then being able to come up with appropriate strategies with uh, a good implementation basis and I, I think it is useful to to one note that the covid issue is one that requires a, a three-part solution uh, we need to be mindful of what needs to happen in the current what i'm calling rescue mode when we needed to do things at all costs and there we are looking at things like say social protection keeping businesses alive purchasing vaccines that that's rescue for me uh, the recovery mode is the second bucket where you begin to uh, move away from the the rescue stage you're seeing shoots of of growth and you are beginning to get your feet, things are moving, but not that very fast. And then the what I, I think of as the rebuild um, or the potential mode where you want to now make sure that you are positioning yourself in a way for the future, your longer term growth. And to be able to do that, I think you, you have to do equally three things. One is we need to be able to reimagine what our future is going to be because it's clear we are not going to come out of covid unscarred we have to rebalance and that rebalancing now takes into account some of the inequities that exist in a, as a result of covid but were there before and maybe were intensified and reposition as the third uh, repositioning now says what do we need to do to reposition ourselves to put us in a different space which is the future that we are talking about how we reimagine it and cdb's right. cdb's focus in fact is in all of those areas uh we, so on the three that you listed earlier rescue yeah. recovery and rebuild which yes. one of those prongs are we on now or are and we, we doing all three simultaneously we're, rescue mode. we're still in the rescue we're still in rescue because uh and in specific terms you're looking at rescue for example in terms of the debt the interest relief the the debt repayment where cdb for its member countries um in in greater need we are able to allow them to get relief by not having to pay principal and interest for a year uh, to give them that little relief from the added expenses that they needed to meet say for covid related expenses um, equally there are governments that are looking at say emergency support in the case say for example of saint vincent it's not exactly covid but similar in in, in crisis mode uh, there will be that sort of line there are those that are looking right. at uh, say assistance with the budgets that is kind of rescue moving into recovery mode the the bigger issue is how do you balance out what you are doing in rescue or recovery mode with what you need to do in the repositioning mode because right. that rebuilding which is more about shifting your potential to mm. different space is really what we are talking about in terms of growth the recovery stroke rescue is more to get you towards where you were before covid and unfortunately that seems to take a bit of time in our economies so we might be in that making up mode not growth mode making up mode uh, for quite some time a few years at least before we get back to where we were and you could easily see this by looking at the magnitude of the fall in gdp growth yeah, that occurred in 2020 and how many years it might take you granted covid may or at least we hope covid doesn't last for too too long how many years it takes you to get back first to that level and to appreciate that the the spending the investment all of the effort that went in during that space hasn't really grown you beyond where you were before COVID. It has simply recovered you back to where you were pre-COVID. And so- And then pre-COVID was also, we have also been as a region experiencing extremely low growth pre-COVID 
to yeah. begin with. And I think one of the things that that this pandemic has highlighted, not that we didn't know it before, we're too tourism dependent as a region. It, we depend too much on tourism. We knew that because every hurricane season and hurricane come and mash up country, whichever country it is in the, in the region. And yeah. we say we're too tourism dependent. And now here comes the pandemic and that has mashed up the whole region's tourism industry. So how do we start getting countries to diversify their economies? Because I don't know if it's a reluctance or it's just tourism is easy because the beaches are there. How do we start getting our countries to, to focus on other things that can bring in, bring in income and build you jobs? Make, you, make, you make a very good point. Um, and let me, permit me just to move back on, on two things. One is we had problems before COVID. Right. And we should not, while COVID has amplified, we should not see it that we were squeaky clean before and finally having been a year and a half in COVID that we have now become bad. No, we, we were bad before COVID. It's just gotten worse. So the point you make about the we were not growing before, we were not growing before is equally symptomatic of what I was describing may take time to happen. The period of the global financial recession that occurred 2008-9, on average, it took our countries four to five years before they even made up where they were before 2008-9 crisis. And beyond that, whereas much of the world moved on and grew beyond where they were before 2008, our growth rates have been at best anemic. And that is precisely the same situation I think we are in now, not because the global financial crisis uh, reduced us, but because we at that time also had the very export concentration issue that we are facing now. And it is quite clear, the more export concentration you have, the lower actually your potential to grow your per capita GDP over time. So that is a structural weakness that becomes incumbent on our countries to fix. Now, I do know, and that's the, the gist of the question you're asking, uh, people still see the mono export or few export markets as the, the holy grail of how we will continue to live. I think we have to see COVID as a wake up call to action that tells us we cannot continue to have this over and over again. Um, and the only way we can pivot out is to look for ways in which we can one, tackle the issue of market resilience, which in essence is economic diversification. That way when you have shocks, when things hit you, you have enough of a buffer in terms of your spread to at least be able to manage uh, one way or the other. Now, I, I say that... So what should we diversify to? Well, what should we diversify to is a, is a big question. Um, you cannot dictate it. I think you have to focus on not picking a winner, but picking the, win, the, the willing. Um, that's a phrase that Professor Mazzucato, who gave our innovation lecture, uh, used um, a couple of weeks ago. If there is a willingness from the private sector and there is a complementary um, support from the public sector, the government sector, and that they see themselves as working jointly, collaboratively towards meeting the one common goal of building economies that are resolute, resilient, or that will provide growth opportunities for the people as that ultimate goal, then the two work in a sense collaboratively for a common purpose. That is what I think we don't have now. Um, and that is what's maybe stymieing, I wouldn't say preventing, stymieing the growth of that economic diversification that we need because governments tend to view the private sector with a certain degree of suspicion. Private sector tends to view government with a certain degree of trepidation or maybe even suspicion. And they are both failing to realize 
that the two together need to work collaboratively to advance mm-hmm. the nation, the people. And I think well, I know that as as you know, as a lender, as a development bank in particular, CDB would have some ideas on what types of things can help us out because that's where you are going to concentrate funds for on lending to to borrowing member countries. So so what industries do you see as being key to to taking us out? Yeah, but that that's exactly picking an industry. Um, <laughs> in situ- <laughs> no, not one, uh, several industries. I, I don't mind I don't mind coming back, but in principle what you what you want as a, a lender is a request for funds that you are going to assess a with regard to viability and b with regard to its development objective the development goal when you have those two aligned you make a decision uh, you say yes i am willing to enter that particular space that is not the same as saying i'm going to back a particular industry come what may in fact i would argue i would argue the reverse my common purpose that i would like to say i think we we need to embrace one of them would be for example bridging the digital divide in the region to zero in other words everyone uh, should be able to have access to let's say the internet as a goal uh, we should not have any division between those who have and don't have access that's a goal so supposing we say 100% full digitalization as the common goal that we would like to embrace now you could think what are the supporting sectors that would allow that to happen one of which would probably be the telecom industry another one could very well be um uh, let's say communications another element could be probably a regulatory element right, um, right and those three now i'm not picking i'm not picking any one of them and there will be others that would be there as sectors that have to collaborate coordinate and they will spump more or less come up almost spontaneously because the opportunities will arise but they would all be focused on generating what is needed to get us to that goal which everyone shares of zero divide in the digital space if you right. can see the difference of well, how i'm trying to to cast that and the goal of getting there when we arrive there if you were to look back i think if we go there in a few years time what you will actually find is that not one or two or three but maybe many complementary industries would have contributed in their own way on their terms as willing and so right. if you if you were to push me i would be making say, similar arguments that digitalization would be one and i would say we would be willing to support as a bank any of any of the industries that when bundled together would meet that goal because that goal is what's more important not the specific right. at the time it's right. a big difference right. I, i hope i was clear it's a big difference between picking one as opposed to picking a mission a goal as- I see yes yes I definitely yep. see what you're saying. So yep. well before we go Dr. Leon I have to ask about hurricane season because yes. no we have pandemic we have yep. countries like St. Vincent still dealing with the after effects of the volcanic eruption and yep. now we're in the middle of hurricane season. Is the CDB in a position to deal with all these crises at the same time should god forbid we be affected again this year? Well let, let's hope let's hope we don't get a very bad season although I I think the prediction is for somewhere 5 to 7 very um uh, severe hurricanes we might have now they may not hit shore and therefore we may all be not worried about it but it, it is a, a real threat and um we should be thinking contingency planning um the problem that one faces at all times is a a financing constraint uh, we surely don't have resources to meet every eventuality um and and so i i i think there has to be 
more than CDB. There has to be now a, a coalition of the willing, a coalition with regard to financing, and there will be the donors, there will be the CDB. Uh, we'll be looking at um, the other EFAs, the World Bank, the IMF, um, the UN, the traditional ones that do provide that sort of umbrella support for catastrophes when they when they occur. The same ones, in fact, who have started the process of trying to help in the COVID space, and some that have been trying to help St. Vincent in the volcano space. Uh, if the if we were to have one or two hurricanes that hit us, then let's hope they might be equally willing to be able to, to assist. And so I think there has to be that sense of CDB can very well be the, I wouldn't say coordinator, but surely um, we can be advocate, we can be protagonist um, as a means of trying to raise awareness of the, the potential plight that our countries may actually face and be willing to galvanize and bring together as, as many willing donors and players as possible to to meet such a contingency if it if it were to occur. On on that same point, I just saw an article from the Financial Times saying that developing countries haven't seen the worst of the pandemic yet because many countries are now reaching that limit of how much they can borrow, right. and that's a big problem. So. Right. Fortunately for Jamaica, we haven't really had to borrow throughout the pandemic. So at least that puts Jamaica in particular in a, a good position well, compared it, to others. It is the case that normally when you have a crisis as big as that, countries that entered the crisis in a stronger position with better buffers, with less problems to face, are better able to manage that crisis as long as it is not too prolonged. Um, the, the problem we are going to face with COVID now is nobody really knows exactly how long exactly. the duration of COVID is going to be. And even when COVID is done, there is equally, if I would just go back to the point I made at the beginning about the duration that it took to get back to where we were after the end of the global financial crisis, a similar thing may occur here. COVID may end, but it may very well be five years, seven years before we get back to the pre-COVID times. And I'm not saying it's five or seven, I'm just using this as a number. Uh, but post-global financial crisis, it was an average of four years. Um, it may very well, and then COVID was much deeper than the, than the um, time of the global financial crisis. So I, I really... Well, I hope this wake up call really does wake us up and <laughs> the growth that we experience post pandemic can be sustained. And it's not just that uh, that recovery number, that immediate jump that you see after a disaster. Thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Leo, and all the best to you. Thank you very much. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Time now for your market recap. Brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. The Jamaica Stock Exchange advanced, with the combined index increasing by less than half a percent. 108 stocks traded across both the main and the junior markets of the JSC for the week ending Friday, July 9, 2021. 53 advanced, 44 declined, and 11 stayed the same. Just over 68 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling $1 billion. Wigton Wind Farm Ordinary shares traded the most, taking up nearly 10% of the market. The stock gained one cent to close at 59 cents. Trans Jamaican Highway traded the second highest with people buying and selling 6 million shares in the company. The stock remained unchanged to close the week at $1.23. And Fesco rounded out the most traded, taking up 8% of market volume. The stock gained 2 cents to open this week at $1.44. Now let's see who had the biggest gains. SSL Venture Capital Jamaica was last week's top stock, rising nearly 37% to close the week at 86 cents. MPC Caribbean Clean Energy's stock price rose 26% to come in second for last week's biggest gains. The stock opens this week at $147.
Rounding out the biggest gains was First Rock Capital Holdings USD stock, which rose 20% to close the week at 9 cents US. On the losing side now, Portland JSX was the biggest loser for the week, down 24%. The stock closed last week at $7.12. Productive Business Solutions' 9.75% cumulative redeemable preference stock was second on the list. Its price went down 20%. The stock opens this week at $80. And rounding off the biggest losers, Nutsford Express Services, which dropped 18% to close the week at $7.09. Market Recap was brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think Wealth. Think Sagicor Investments. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers. Welcome back to Taking Stock. I've got a team of analysts to examine the week in business. I'm joined this week by Greg Lindo. He's Assistant General Manager at JMMB Group. We also have business writer at The Observer newspaper, David Rose, and financial coach and founder and CEO of Profit Jumpstarter, Keisha Bailey's back. Welcome, everybody. Hi, Keisha, David, Greg. Nice to see you. Hi. Hey. Good to be back. Hey. Good to be back, indeed. So we have a few things to talk about this week. One of my favorite topics is this pilot of central bank digital currency, Jamaica's central bank digital currency, CBDC, the digital Jamaican dollar. I've been looking forward to this, and you know there have been some delays with the launch of the pilot. And Keisha, they now say that that is slated to start in August. What do we know? Yes, so certainly big things happening. The rollout's gonna be in August, starting with NCB. And the plan there is that the central bank is expanding what it refers to as its sandbox in terms of testing for the new CBDC rollout. So what that will look like is that NCB would be brought into the pilot rollout they will continue to work on the development of the, the currency and deployment into general tender. And then by September to December, the plan is that the rollout will continue to the other commercial banks and the deposit taking institutions and the payment service providers. The full launch will take place in 2022, but it's very exciting to see that the rollout is taking up speed. So that's something definitely to look out for. The, the digital currency is going to be one to one with a Jamaican dollar, meaning one Jamaican dollar is the same as the digital currency is going to be. And you're going to be able to use that to do transactions, your day to day transactions. There's a lot of talk also about using the digital currency to make government payments. So your past payments and the pension payments will eventually be paid out in this new CBDC, the digital currency. So that's exciting. It is very exciting. I actually made a request to be part of the pilot project, but <laughs> they, they, they denied me. They did, I guess they don't want me. You know, pilot is a test phase and there will be glitches. Yeah. They probably don't want to scare people away if, you know, we're reporting on you know, how it actually is going. But I'm very excited about this. Greg, what difference do you think this will make to the economy, having a digital dollar? Well, it certainly should help with um, efficiency in terms of having more efficient transactions. I know there is a plan to use it as a as a conduit to kind of reach some of the unbanked persons. There's a, still a large percentage of the population that is unbanked, and having a digital currency, you know, is start to give more accessibility to some of those persons. Um, it it, it kind of reminds me of the mobile money project which has been around for a few years now um it'll be interesting to see the take up and the practical applications because having the technology is great but there's still a very important part is people have to use it right so how are you right. going to get persons involved in using it and applications of how they use it is going to be critical to its success otherwise you might have this nice technology, digital currency with a low take up rate. Um, so we have to kind of ensure that we're the, the, the financial institutions and the central bank are engaging the stakeholders as much as possible to educate and ensure as wide a distribution as possible. I'm very interested to see how it actually works. What's the technology behind it? Is, it? is it from your phone? How, how exactly do you do it? David, what about you? What are your thoughts on the CBDC? Well, it's going to be an interesting time to see how we actually 
shift and move further in towards the digital economy because as you as already known jamaica has had such a very bad situation regarding financial inclusion so you know persons are just existing in the system will probably do have access to the former system either and you know the boj isn't talking about or touting the eKYC, know your customer advantages that are going to come from this new digital currency and even the trans jamaican highway they're actually involved in the pilot right now so you see you know how they can actually facilitate the transactions at the toll through this digital currency that i went to the pilot you know to help reduce the cash use on their end as well and it's going to be a very interesting mm -hmm. test run seeing as that how more countries are going towards cbdc to basically bring presence to the system so china right now is going full speed ahead with its uh, cbdc you know after this tackling taking on bitcoin and by uh, the currencies but it's a good step forward in terms of you know bringing persons forward absolutely exciting times ahead but greg you raised a great point so how do you get people to use it people who are tech savvy like like us on this panel sure but for those who are still reluctant to even use a regular bank let's see how that goes if it actually does reach the unbanked population as is the objective yeah. so let's look at some economic indicators now and we like to look at these because they give us an idea of what sectors are growing what, uh, what we need to be looking at for our investments and so on. And so now we're looking at the inflation expectations, meaning how, how much are prices likely to go up or down, Greg? What are the inflation expectations for the next few months? Well, if we look at what has been happening globally, right, there's this, the buzzword, I guess, is transitory inflation, which is pretty much the expectation that as the economy reopens, you know, there's a lot of spending and, you know, there's a lot of demand for commodities. So prices have spiked. Um, the, some of the consensus that I've heard is it's really it's a short term expectation. But nonetheless, we still have to be aware of what is going to happen locally because we've already seen, I'm sure all of us here have seen prices move higher in almost everything we consume. If it's gas, mm -hmm. food prices and then the next the next um question that we raise is okay what does this mean for interest rates and then by extension with interest rates what does that mean for your investments and if you have fixed income investments certainly rising interest rates aren't good for you um if you're invested in equities there's gonna be also an impact on um the valuation of that portfolio as well because real returns will tend to fall if interest rates rise but so far, the central bank, uh, that's the Bank of Jamaica, uh, has indicated, I mean, it's still within their 4 to 6% range. Um, certainly, there's a bit of a lag effect, so I wouldn't be surprised if it goes a little bit higher, but the long-term expectation is that things will eventually normalize. I mean, of course, there's going to be a spike in demand once persons get out, and we've recently seen some relaxation in the COVID restrictions locally that may actually result in persons being more active. So certainly there's, there is going to be some short-term pressure, but I still believe that the long-term view for interest rates, which is central to, you know, your investments and what the impact on your investments, there's still a bit of a, there's still a bit of, ex, or there is expectation that rates will remain um, low, certainly until we start to see a meaningful recovery in the, economy that's the gdp numbers so you know although i hear a lot of persons asking about inflation and it is a real impact i mean we've all felt it i believe that the long-term view is that rates should still remain low but you may just have to brace yourself for higher prices in the short to medium term Absolutely. I feel like we need to do some type of a lot. Well, I need to do some type of long term study on the real impact of inflation, not just what the statisticians tell us. But for those yeah. who tend to, you know, buy a lot of imported goods, for example, <laughs> how much has inflation really hit our pockets? Because I trust it me, hit. <laughs> too, it too, hit. Little, too small bag, you know. Too small bag, and they tell me no, it I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Twenty thousand yeah. and I look. I looked at the bags, and I looked at the cashier. Looked at the bags. I look at the you know the little thing on the cashier. Yeah. 
and start, you know, mentally trying to calculate the price. I'm like, it's really twenty thousand dollars for this. And yeah, put it back. We all, we, we, we've all got the sticker shock of what supermarket is these days. Trust me, the past year or so, the past six months six especially months. has been traumatic for people yeah. who you know go have yeah. to uh, are responsible for shopping for groceries for their families, paying bills and that sort of thing. Traumatic. So, oh my gosh. The, the biggest. Well, the biggest part of the inflation, the CPI basket, is food. And so as we, we have to contend with weather and that impact now on agricultural prices, it does spill into food prices at the supermarket, what you pay for your KFC, what you pay for your yam and banana. Those prices tend to push higher and businesses pass those on to the consumer. So we feel it in our pocket even more and more. I like... Um, um, Greg's point on the impact of inflation. I always like tying it back to inf investments. And one beneficiary of higher interest rates are financial companies, banks. They tend to do well in a higher interest rate environment. So uh, while I believe, yes, we have a lot of talks on transitory inflation, I think some amount of it is here to stay. And the play on that side would be the financials if we, we have persistent inflation flowing through. No, I, I keep coming back to that interview that we did a couple of weeks ago with um, uh, the gentleman from the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce and the tweet that uh, was Richard made Pandohi. by Richard Pandohi of the JMEA and the increasing cost, like the, the exponential shipping. increasing cost of shipping and yes. you know, to break for the next few months to be even worse than what we've experienced over the first six months of this year. We're looking at containers that used to cost three thousand dollars now costing twenty five thousand US dollars. Ouch! Yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah. So even Here's more a... case, even more case when we talk about inflation. I just did a, a Money Monday's JA episode on savings versus investing. And one of the points that I made in that was that if you want to beat inflation, you got to be investing. Yep. <laughs> and so that <laughs> gives right. us a, a stronger case for investments, right, Greg? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to stay invested in, in the good times, the bad times, and the indifferent times. You have to stay invested. Open that well, investment account to JMMB. Yeah. Yeah. can help with that. The point of Kalila was that on Twitter, uh, the TRP, TRP Insights actually had a study done based on CPI data, Consumer Price mm -hmm. Index. They did a study and showed that, you know, $1,000 nominally back in 2000 would have given you about six loaves of bread. So at the time, bread would cost a lot less. No prices, those were then, but it's like $400 now for a loaf of bread. And the thing is, when they did the track with the CPI data over a period of time, up to like 2019, 2020, you can only buy one loaf of bread now with that same nominal amount of money, which just shows you the impact inflation has had over time, decreasing your purchasing power as time progresses. So the same amount of money you had back in 2000 is buying a lot less in, in the present day or the future now. Because in the Jimmy Can Beef Party, as someone said, it was $25 back in 2004. Back in 2000, it was $8. Now it's basically $180 for a beef party. And that's Jamaica's most common staple and has acted as a technical gauge of inflation in the country. And, you know, regular inflation in the country, like inflation, some of us feel from the goods that we purchase in the supermarket, which are, you know, things that we need, but we don't necessarily produce in Jamaica. And the US dollar depreciation, the shipping costs, those commodity spikes, it's a lot I was going to say that America. because it's not just inflation at play, there's also mm -hmm. that devaluation especially during that period that we had with the IMF and then since COVID as well. Because 2008, yep. when I first came to Jamaica, the exchange rate was like 75 to 1. And now it's double that. More than it's 150. They're about 153. In, yep. in 13 years, 14 years. Great. Anywho, speaking of inflation, let's take a look at sorry speaking of investments let's take a look at proven investments their results are out david what are the highlights from proven so proven's normalized net profit was up by four percent to 11.53 million us dollars us dollars specifically and these are to say normalized net profit is because during the 2020 financial year proven disposed of 25 percent of access which is in reclassifying access to an associate 
and also recording a gain on their disposal of access. So pretty much normalized that property was by 4%, and that was driven mainly by two core subsidiaries, which was proven well. Property was up double digits. <coughs> property was up double digits to 2.77 million US dollars, and also by Boston, whose consolidated net profit was up by 26% to 6.26 million US dollars. The subsidiary that basically took a major hit during the period were International Financial Planning Services Limited, IFP, and Dream Entertainment Limited, which is an associate, which is an associate of proven but a very small associate. So in the case of IFP, their profit went down by like 43% to 410,000 US dollars. And that was because of the lockdowns in Cayman, which, you know, they're trying to control the COVID spread and they make most of the income from fees and commissions um, in Cayman and Bermuda. So with not much deals going on, you're going to be hitting your revenue base. And as well as to Basil, Basil has, Chris Williams said it himself, it's going to probably go as their best acquisition to date. So proven it, but Basel back in 2017 for 12.6 million US dollars. They sold 25% of it back to the current CEO, but over that time frame, from then to now, Proven has collected US 9.26 million dollars, 9.62 million US dollars in dividends, intercompany dividends from Basel. So call it within five, six years, Proven has basically got back all of their money from this strong subsidiary, which is going to continue delivering results. And Proven is still waiting on the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority to green light or, you know, give them the go ahead to acquire Fidelity Bank in Cayman. And that when, if that deal goes through, if that deal really goes through, Proven is going to have your asset base explode to more than one billion US dollars. So it went up by 13% for the 2021 financial year to $674 million. And with, if the Boston deal, sorry, if the Fidelity deal goes through, it's going to be a whole new game for Proven because 2019 started with 20 million US dollars. So a couple of capital raises, debt raises, and so on over the couple over the last decade, and almost a billion dollars. And they finalized the Roberts with the Barbados acquisition. And based on my calculations, Proven should be able to realize a gain acquisition of about 4.2 million US dollars whenever it's recognized in their, in their income statement. And they are also acquiring Heritage for International Limited, which is based in the Bahamas. So Proven had a pretty decent year from the as a normalized standpoint. Dream had a rough year. They contributed a share of loss of $68,000. And when we calculated that, that came to about, I believe, $340,000 for the measured period that Dream was recorded on Proven's financials, which turns out to be about, yeah, about 51 million JMD but dreams last for the overall year because of the COVID pandemic. So looking forward to what Proven does in the coming year to really bring, push the gas mm -hmm. forward. And we're waiting to hear whether Dream gets that approval to host Dream Weekend coming up. Uh, speaking with Scott Dunn last week, they are geared up to go. They have Dream New York coming up. They have a whole lot of stuff coming up. Uh, and Proven, well, JMMB is an associate company of Proven. Proven owns 20% of JMMB. Greg, I'm sure that uh, that JMMB's performance, your company's performance, also mm -hmm. contributed positively to, to Proven's results. Yeah, yeah, we would have reported a, another very strong year end. And, you know, by extension, we own 22% of Sajikor. So, you know, that also started to contribute positively to our bottom line and further to Proven's um, profitability. So, you know, that investment is also paying off pretty well for them, I'd say. The world is a cycle. Yeah, everybody's yeah. one big, it's yeah. one big family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Some people say systemic risk, but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's that too. <laughs> yeah, so there's that too. Keisha, what are your thoughts on proven investments? I absolutely love the the setup of that company. I love the business model. I I think I agree with um, David. There's lots of growth ahead. 
um, specifically the Fidelity Bank and the Heritage Fund acquisitions are really going to lend to continued profitability going forward. One thing I'm particularly looking for is with the change in St. Lucian laws around the need for proving economic substance. I'm looking to see how exactly will proven meet the, the requirements of that regulation because they're going to have to spend capital within that jurisdiction to be able to get that economic substance, the, the tax benefits associated with that. So I'm very curious to see how they're going to play that one out. We need to, we definitely need to talk some more about that another time, the changes to the, the IPC right. laws in St. Lucia, as yeah. well as this new international tax, international global tax. Global tax, business that's tax. Yes, yes. That's it, right, that the, that the Biden administration is pushing. We need to have a more Very focused and in-depth conversation on that another time. Thank you so much for your input this time, guys. Thank you. Take care. To be a part of right, take care. Leader. Yes, take care. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel, and share with a friend. Also, subscribe to our newsletter at kalilareynolds.com slash newsletter and turn on those post notifications so that you can be the first to see all my other features. We want to help people learn more about money so we can all get this money together. So this week on Money Mondays JA, we live where they vacation. I'll talk to you about real estate investing in the Caribbean. On Money Moves JA, Laren Peart from Blue Dot is back. He'll tell us how to conduct a market survey for little or no money. Later this week, it's Digital Marketing 101. We'll recap the last webinar from Flow Business. And of course, stay tuned for the next installment in our feature on Pulse Investments. We'll take a look at how the pandemic has impacted their modeling business. And guess what? It's not what you might expect. Now follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Kalila Ray and follow at TakingStockJA on Instagram. If you want to connect with the analysts this week, check the description box below for their contact information. Also, visit our website, kalilareynolds.com, for financial information you can use however you like it. Watch, listen, or read. Now tell a friend about taking stock because investing is the new sexy. So let's make it cool to talk about money. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Let's get this money. Let's get this money. <laughs> Ha 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 ha!